Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a recent read, so three books I've recently finished. Uh, the Posthumous Memoirs of Brass Cubas by Machado de Assis. Uh, second collection of poetry by the Jamaican poet Kai Miller that I've read. This is called In Nearby Bushes. And thirdly, another poetry collection, uh, The New Black by Evie Shockley, which I was recommended by Courtney Ferreter. So I'm going to start with the novel. So the first thing to say is that uh, this was written in the last couple of decades of the 19th century. Yes, the rare... Uh, occurrence of me reading a pre-20th century book. Um, I can't remember quite how I came across it in terms of sort of finding out about it, but it's it's quite Tristram Shandy-like, let's put it that way. I've never read Tristram Shandy, um, but I know enough about it, obviously, through the, you know, it percolates into the cult culture to know that, yeah, this, and this does even name-check it. Uh, so Machado de Assis is Brazilian, uh, I think this is a Brazilian classic, but it wasn't translated to English for uh, sort of 70 years after its publication in Portuguese. Uh, and it's sort of, this is a new edition and a very good edition. I, you know, if you're going to read this book, I would I would recommend getting this new Penguin Classics edition, which has just come out, uh, which is translated by... Uh, Flora Thompson DeVoe and she does a brilliant job and the notes in the back are, are so informative not only on the sort of the literary references that um, that uh, Assis employs because obviously uh, they all predate 1880 so they may not be familiar to us uh, but also she points out differences in uh, various editions uh, over the years including um, Assis's own you know deletions he deletes quite a few literary references and yet leaves in others and, and it's quite interesting as she sort of explains uh, why that might be so why do I say this is like Tristan Shani so it's the story of a of a sort of lower noble man a bit of a wastrel um, uh, doesn't marry uh, makes a lot of the mistakes of, of youth and stuff um, and is actually sent away by his father uh, to university uh, because of his his behaviour. And then he comes back and uh, he has a long, long time affair with a mistress of a, a married man who's a politician uh, in Brazil. So that is the basic story. But it starts off that he has died and that he is narrating this from his grave. And it starts off with a dedication to the worm that first gnawed at the cold flesh of my cadaver. I dedicate as fond remembrance these posthumous memoirs. And that gives you an idea of the humour of the book. There's a lot of digression in Tristan Shandy's style. Um, he's talking to the reader a lot. He, he's sort of, you know, addressing the, the camera, as it were. And remember, this was written in 1880. Um, I know Tristan Shandy does that as well, but it's still quite, quite sort of radical. And it's very funny. It's also, you know, it's, it's a meditation on uh, love, uh, life, death, uh, men and women, slavery, because Brazil had, a, you know, imported more slaves than even America did. Um, all of this stuff is in there, but it's always done uh, with sort of serious intent on the one hand, and great humour on the other. And it's just good fun, you know. Uh, there is, the only time it lags is towards the end where he's uh, sort of getting drawn into this sort of new philosophy called uh, humanity, humani not humanitarianism as we know it, but a sort of a, a will to power version of that called humanitas. Um, I, thought, I thought it lagged a bit there. But otherwise, it was just a rollicking good read. And I'm just, you know, the, the relationship of, of, you know, talking to the cat, to the to the reader, as it were. Just going to give you an example of that. So he's just, he's just, uh, you know, it looks like one of the periodical, you know, permanent splits from his mistress. I did not see her off, but at the appointed hour, I felt something that was neither pain nor pleasure. A mixture of relief and longing mingled together in equal proportion. Reader, do not be irritated by this confession. 
I am well aware that in order to titillate your fancy, I ought to sink into tremendous despair, shed a few tears and forego lunch. It would be novelesque, but it would not be biographical. The pure reality is that I lunched, as I had on other days, suckering my heart with the memories of my adventure and my stomach with the delicacies of Monsieur Proudhon. So that's the sort of the, the level of humour. Uh, and this is another chapter called The Floor in the Book, by which he means his own book. I'm beginning to regret that I ever took to writing this book. Not that it tires me, I have nothing else to do. And dispatching a few meagre chapters into the other world is invariably a bit of a distraction from eternity. But the book is tedious. It reeks of the grave. It bears a cadaveric grimace. This is a grave defect, and yet a minor one on the whole, for this book's greatest flaw is you, reader. You are in a hurry to grow old, and the book moves slowly. You love direct, robust narration and a smooth and regular style. And this book and my style are like drunkards. They veer right and left, stop and go, grumble, bellow, crackle, threaten the sky, slip and fall. And they fall. Wretched leaves of my cypress tree, you too must fall, like all others so beautiful and splendid. And had I eyes, I would shed a tear of remembrance for you. This is the great advantage of death. While it leaves no mouth to laugh, nor does it leave eyes to weep. You too must fall. And I think that gives you an idea of the book. You know, he's always uh, sort of breaking out of his narrative to, to, to comment on his own book or to sort of make uh, allusions to something that only has tangential uh, linkage to what he's talking about. And also the translation where, you know, he sort of talk about, you know, this book is tedious, it reeks of the grave, it bears a cadaveric grimace, this is a grave defect. So the translator has sort of kept the, the, the pun or the, the, the two meanings of the word grave in grave defect. So, you know, as I say, a rollicking good read. Uh, oh, I would say the chapters are really, really short, again, which helps speed up your pace through the book. Um, so, yeah, four stars. And on to my second collection of Kai Miller poetry. This is called In Nearby Bushes. And its theme is the sort of the spaces in between, the, the, the spaces that we never give any consideration. In this case, bushes uh, in Jamaica, because they play host to criminality, murders, rapes committed under the safety of bushes, uh, bodies are dumped there, but also the, 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 you know, the unknown, but not necessarily malign power of bushes that, you know, sometimes a, a cockerel can, or a rooster can um, wander out of the bushes and you're, you know, you've been scared by the rattle, you know, what's going to come out? And it's the innocent thing of a, co of a cockerel. So that, that's the basic theme of, of this, uh, of this collection. And like the other one I read, it, you know, has lots of really good poems, great imagery, good ideas. It's not quite as consistent as that other one. And I'll, I'll post the link to my review of that. But there are still some some great, great stuff in here. So this is called The Understory. Now, I've not read Richard Powers' The Overstory, but, you know, I'm sure there's, there's sort of connections there. Here, that is the unplotted plot, the intriguing twist of vines, the messy dialogue... Just listen how the leaves are and are and err uh, non-stop. The horse dead and the cow fat is here as well. The sod story, the tall story and the same old story. Whomever did tell you there were two sides to every story is someone who don't know the true nature of stories. Try 200 or 2000 and they are all here. A web of Nancy story hangs thick between the trees. The original accounts of witnesses are here as well. A careful record of all subsequent changes. You may compare. The long bench is here, perfectly sized that you might hear the long story that will not be cut short. Here where is the hard luck story, the likely and unlikely stories, and all the tales that were put on shelves. Oh, the teller had said, waving a hand, that's a whole other story. Well, my dear, they are here, in the complication of roots, in the dirtiness of dirt. Are there stories you have heard about Jamaica? Well, here are the stories underneath. So, and another brief one. Sometimes I consider the name of places, which links to his cartography uh, collection as well, where he talks about place names. But this is on a country scale rather than a, a you know, Jamaican village or town scale. Sometimes I consider the name of places, 
New York as if York was not enough. New Orleans as if Orleans was not enough. New England as if England was not enough. The New World as if this world was not enough. Um, the third part of this collection is, is specifically about um, crimes of bodies found in bushes uh, reported in the various Jamaican newspapers. And he plays around with the, uh, the sort of um, topography uh, of, of these reports. So he, report, he gives the report straight and then he plays around by highlighting certain words and even certain letters. And those bolded letters then spell out words like danger or, or whatever. It's really skillfully done. And so, yeah, I say not quite as tight uh, as his previous collection that I read, but still very, very good. Five stars. I do have a third collection in Miller's to read. Um, I'm not quite sure I'm going to get to that. And uh, another poetry collection, uh, The New Black by Evie Shockley, who is a person of colour. Um, I thought this was a very solid collection. There were some poems that just sort of I glazed over. I didn't really have a sort of rapport with them. But then you get, you know, you get a poem like this called To See the Minus. The ghost, the thing we could touch if its throbbing absence were any more vast, any more like a molecule of Jupiter, all mass weighing us down, but nothing we could put a finger on. We squint to see the minus. Water take away holy, take away book, take away tree, take away phantom limb, a connection our brains keep trying to make with the dead and the gone. Minus family, minus portrait, minus heirloom, minus hand-me-down, minus hand. Subtract the noise in the street, subtract the streets. Minus keepsake, minus God's sake, minus evidence of things unseen. The ghost, the thing we could touch if our throbbing phantom limb really connected. Our brains keep trying to make sense of it. The life's work, the first or second generation's at last accumulated wealth undone by the wind, washed clean away in polluted water. If ever there was ample space for faith and despair, it is here, room enough to tackle a vision. So I thought that was a really powerful statement of, of memory, uh, because memory almost, which I hadn't really made the connection, but memory almost always involves absence, not necessarily just of a dead person, someone who's died, but the very nature of what you're trying to preserve in a memory that moment, that event has gone, you keep it alive in memory, but of course, A, that's edited by your, you know, your brain, B, it might not be accurate, because, you know, sometimes we colour things or tilt things, uh, a memory can't reproduce in 100% correlation, the original event, and also there's a difference between you living an event or an incident and you recalling it and memorising So I just thought that was a really powerful, simple image of the minus which brilliantly dissects the whole, you know, how memory works and stuff. So, as I say, you know, very, very solid, really good in parts. Others I slightly glazed over. Uh, um, four stars. And what I'm currently reading is uh, Kamal Daoud Zabor or the Psalms. Uh, Kamal Daoud wrote uh, the Merceau investigation, which was his answer to Camus the Stranger because Daoud is Algerian and the Stranger is about the uh, French colonial killing uh, a Tunis uh, an, uh, an Algerian on the beach in in uh, Oran I think um, and it and that was a very angry retort saying you know you it's all about the the French guy who, who pulled the trigger it's not about those left behind to mourn their their dead Algerian relative this is uh, his follow-up. He's only written sort of two works of fiction. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it too much at the moment, but I'm, you know, I'm really enjoying it. It's, it's, you know, Daoud is a journalist, and I normally look down at journalists who try and write fiction, um, including George Orwell, uh, because the the techniques of journalism are very different to the techniques of fish of fiction. Um, but this is this is uh, really, really, you know, the, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have thought he was a journalist because of the sheer inventiveness and literariness and artisticness of this book, which I, I normally find those adjectives are precluded uh, by the, the, the journalist tra journalistic training. Anyway, uh, so hopefully I'll get to talk about this next week. 
Um, and finally, I'm just going to talk briefly about a comment I made uh, when I was talking about the uh, Machado de Assis, how surprising it was that I was reading a sort of pre-20th century book. So when I've talked in the past about how I don't read uh, books before the 20th century, I've rather glibly sort of said these books don't speak to me. And it all started off when I had to study Jane Austen at school uh, for my English literature. And I said, you know, I can appreciate this is the work of a supreme stylist, but these books don't speak to me. Now, I've never read Dickens, and presumably if I had read Dickens, you know, um, his slightly sort of journalistic approach to issues of the day, in theory, should speak to me. Uh, you know, they, they are literary works, I imagine, that, that deal with issues. Um, but they don't. Uh, uh, partly because I, you know, my degree is in history. So I've studied these periods from a historical point of view rather than a literary one. Um, and, you know, I'll post my link, uh, I'll post the link to my video on HHHH by Lauren Beanie where I discuss in great detail why I fell out of love with history at university and why I don't read historical fiction uh, or even history uh, anymore. Um, but I watched a, a, an interview with the author J.G. Ballard, who's someone I've never read. I mean, obviously I'm aware of the type of writer he was. And it was a brilliant interview because one of the first questions is, um, you know, how do you see yourself as a writer of today, i.e. in the 20th century, being different to someone who's writing in the 19th century? And this, this encapsulates entirely why 19th century novels don't speak to me because the writers there are not unreasonably writing about their time and their age an age which I happen to have studied from a historical point of view but even leaving that aside it it doesn't speak to about my world in the 20th and now the 21st century which is what I'm concerned to read about learn about interrogate all these sorts of things and it's as simple as that um you know that writers writing about my world speak to me in a way that writers writing about their world uh you know a century and a half ago or whatever it is don't speak to me um now you might say well what about writers from other cultures well you know writers from other cultures writing in this world you know the 21st century and the, and the late 20th do speak to me because it's all part of the world that that i live in now you can again you can say this is a very narrow-minded blinkered approach to literature and and you know I'm not going to say that if that's what you feel it isn't but my pressing need to read books to read fiction comes from my pressing need to understand the world that I exist in and also to understand why I exist and all those sorts of things um and it comes down to the world that we're writing about or in this case reading about I want it to be about my world uh, and not a world that has largely disappeared. Yes, humans still behave, this, you know, in similar fashions, but I'm not interested in reading about, you know, ro romantic um, games of uh, of seduction and misunderstanding and, and all of that. They, you know, that that's what I mean. That doesn't speak to me. And it, it probably happens now, although in very different ways with mobile phones and sexting and, and all that sort of stuff. But I'm not interested in reading about those either, to be fair. Uh, it's not a subject that interests me. Um, but, it, you know, if someone put a gun to my head and sort of said, here's a Jane Austen romance versus here's a, uh, a social media romance, you know, you have to read one. I would probably read the social media one because even though I'm not terribly interested in the subject, at least there might be, to me, value gleaned from, well, how do people communicate via social media and and what does that do does that degrade or how does it degrade the nature of romantic speech romantic communication when it's done you know <laughs> virtually and all that sort of stuff but I just wanted to add that sort of footnote really um it you know I have remained very consistent in this and if you know if you want to put the case for for reading the classics and stuff I'll gladly hear it I mean I, I doubt very much that I'd be swayed by it but you know I do welcome people to sort of point out how wrong I am and the value there is to be gleaned 
uh, in pre 20th century fiction. But you know, age 57, limited amount of time to read books. I can't see that I'm going to find the time and go back and, and read such books. Anyway, uh, I, I just thought I'd, I'd tack that on because finally, in my own mind, it was clarified what exactly it is that means that I read 20th century and 21st century novels only. Okay, booktube, thanks very much. Till next time.